thank you for coming to today's um, fireside chat. Welcome to AAP's fourth iteration of our fireside chat um, on the topic of food identity and culture. Um, we're really excited to have all of you here and like our panelists are amazing. They're very passionate, knowledgeable people and you'll come to love them as, you know, Angela and I have um, talked to them and have loved them when we met them. So hopefully you'll have a very enjoyable experience tonight um, talking about this topic, um, which is, I guess, something that we're all inherently tied to, but also something that's not really talked about enough, I think, and how it really affects us in our everyday life. So I just, yeah, we'll get onto the conversation. But before we do that, um, we would like to acknowledge that we are hosting this panel from the Eora and Kula Nations. Um, we would also like to acknowledge that the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work on from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people community. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging and celebrate their diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales and Victoria and from other lands that you are on today. And it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So just to go through um, a bit of just like general housekeeping today, um, there is just a few things that we have to go through. Um, again, just a reminder that this event is being recorded. So it, please uh, don't do anything that you would want you don't want to be shared or recorded on a public platform. If you would not like to be recorded, just turn off your camera. Uh, so today, this is, um, we are the moderators. So myself, I am Michelle, the AAP president, and Angela, um, she is our vice president. So I don't know if you can give her a wave. Um, she will be helping me moderate and assisting me in the Q&A as well. So you'll be able to hear us speak. Um, later on. So for those who don't know much about AAP, we are a social impact organization really focusing on exploring the identity of Asian Australians in Australia. So really focusing on that kind of lived experience um, that we all hold and something that we would, we really like to use as like a descriptor of what we do is ABC. So ABC for us means Asians between cultures. And it really identifies that space between, um, I guess your heritage culture or like your, I guess your ethnicity and then the Australian culture. And just really looking at that space in between where we all exist, because sometimes we don't feel close to our Asian culture or our heritage culture. And sometimes you don't feel close to our Asian culture and it's a very common experience. And I think that's why AAP exists. It's really looking at that middle point in between um, and really critically reflecting our identity and the space that we're occupying. Um, Cause I think often or not, um, we don't get a chance to really reflect on like who we are and how this really impacts not only ourselves, but the people around us. Um, so yeah, that's the work that we do. We mainly hold events, um, but at the moment we're really transitioning to a more um, multitudinous, I think that's the right word, platform. We are currently doing journals. Um, we do pieces on our Instagram as well. And we really try to um, look at things unconventionally, which I guess is what we try to do at AAP. So I guess just a quick introduction to our topic. Um, have you eaten yet? This is a phrase that we can all arguably, em arguably empathize with. It is not only a phrase that conveys concern, but warmth and love. Asian cultures and mannerisms at times means that comfort and empathy are not conveyed directly, but are implied and hidden in meaning. Such is the same with food. As Asians, food can tell us where someone is from, where someone is born, where who they've interacted in life with, and what their influences were growing up. And despite the Asian community being large and diverse, there is one thing we can all agree on. Food is central to our identity and culture. Culture and food are inextricably linked, and but it is also something that can be misunderstood. And being Asian Australian can often mean having to juggle the identities of both Asian and Australian and having to understand where food fits into the space. With that in mind, our panelists are experts in their field, but they also have lived experiences of how food has impacted them. Let's introduce our panelists. First, we have Eska Koo, he, him, was a head chef from Miss Me. Um, I don't know if you want to give away, Eska. <laughs> Hello, yeah. Hey. Um, next is our head chef from Cafe Frida's and Cindy and founder of Megafauna, Shingyi, she, her. Hi. Next is our food historian um, who is currently an uh, honorary research researcher at the University of Western Australia and University of Wollongong, Cecilia Long-Salobia. Hello. I think. 
I think she's waving. <laughs> um, and then lastly, um, Rishani Ipa, she, her, who is a food editor, journalist and critic. Um, and she's also the editor in chief of culinary and amongst her many hats that she wears um, in her life. So, yeah. So I guess to kickstart off this panel, um, I'll ask you got the panelists two questions. And so I guess we'll kick off with Eska. So what is your first meaningful experience with food and how did you get to where you are today? Hey guys. Uh, yeah. So my name is Eska. Uh, I'm a chef. Uh, from Borneo, and I'm currently based in Melbourne, and I'm cooking neo progressive Asian food. My first uh, memorable experience with food would have to be, yeah, when um, just before uh, 10 o'clock, when my dad goes to work, he would always be uh, uh, taking me to a noodle shop that's close by to the workplace. And basically, it's a, a local Chinese dish in Borneo, in North of Borneo, Sabah. Um, it would be uh, kon lo mi, which is dry noodles um, uh, tossed in soy and pork lard, chives, and it'll serve you a side of uh, garnishes and sauces, as well as fish paste tomato soup. Yeah, it was the moment where I was like, wow, this is so delicious. And yeah, I, I, I forever want to always cook and eat delicious fruit from then on. Thanks, Eska, for that. Thanks. Thank no you. worries. We'll go to uh, Xingyi next. Um, hi, my name is Sinyi, and um, I would say that food has always been in my life since I can remember. It's hard to pinpoint a specific first meaningful experience, but my strongest memories come from visits to my family in Malaysia, where I would travel to visit my extended family every couple of years. Food was such a huge part of our visits there, and I literally got to know Kuala Lumpur through the, the food landmarks or the restaurants that my family would take us to. Um, I also had fam my grandparents would also visit every now and then. And I do have this distinct memory of my mother making zhongzi in Sydney. So zhongzi is stuffed sticky rice parcels in bamboo leaves. And she was making them in the, in the middle of winter and her hands would be freezing as she packed the glutinous rice grains um, into the leaves. Yeah, I mean, I took a lot of my experiences with food growing up for granted. And I think it's probably only recently that I've, I've really been examining my connection to those experiences. No worries. Thanks, Chingy. Um, next, we'll go to Cecilia. Hi. So on the surface, um, the incident I relate here may not be that meaningful as a food experience, but it has a profound effect on me as I get older. So I was probably around eight years old. And in, in Malaysia, we celebrated Christmas with a Christmas tree and with special treats, mainly of snacks and sweets. So there was a jar of sweets on top of the meat safe in the kitchen. As kids, we all knew that we were not supposed to touch it until Christmas Day. Anyway, one day I went quietly into the kitchen and when my arm was up reaching for the jar, my papa walked into the kitchen. My arm froze. I expected a big scolding, but all he said was, it's all right, take one. Phew. I was frightened and relieved at the same time. But over the years, I felt so loved by that incident. And since my academic career focused on food history, I've come to understand about food and identity and belonging and all the cultural and social connections. Memories of certain kinds of food takes us back to our childhood, hence the notion of comfort food. We crave it in times of sickness and stress. For many Asians, rice porridge or tzuk or konji is our mainstay in times of sickness and pain. Easy on the stomach, and comforting for the mind. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. I think we can all empathize with at least once in our life when we were caught red-handed eating something that we shouldn't have. I can definitely tell you that has happened to me recently, even though I am already in my mid-20s and I shouldn't really be scared of my parents <laughs> finding me out. But um, yeah, that's definitely happened to us at least once in our life. I'm sure we can empathize. And I guess lastly, Rashani. Hi. Uh, a lot of what's been said has resonated with me, but in terms of, I guess, a memorable food experience um, was like Shinyi just going back to, to visit my, my family that lived in Gaul in Sri Lanka, um, which is a coastal town down the south. I was often too young to, to cook or be allowed to cook. So they would just give me like the little tasks. And one such task that I really loved doing as a kid was um, getting the coconut scraper. And it was just like this big kind of metal structure that was attached to this thick wooden table. Um, and I'd get a coconut that's cut in half and just grind it um, and scrape out all the coconut. Um, and we'd use that desiccated coconut to make like coconut sambal and, and delicious things like that um so that was probably 
my first kind of foray into food at home because yeah, it was my first responsibility. And that kind of showed me how fun cooking could be and how fun making our food could be. And it definitely drew, uh, drew me closer to our own cuisine, which is something I was struggling with living in Australia as a kid. I think that's something that a lot of people where their passion starts from food, like just doing small things in the kitchen, like whether it's just like washing veggies or just washing rice or like chopping something or even like putting things in the bin. I think that's where our passion lies. You're like, wow, I actually contributed to something bigger. And it's like, oh, look, this is a delicious dish. I'm like, I made it Or like, I guess I contributed it to. So it's really lovely to hear that that part of your childhood has really kind of left a deep memory inside of you and that it's quite meaningful. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with us. So I guess um, further than that, we'll move on to the discussion. So this section of the um, discussion is I ask the panelists a statement um, and then they will usually pick a number or they can just say the corresponding, the word with that. And then we'll discuss like, I guess, why the panelists feel that way. And I guess we'll open up into a bigger discussion really about the conceptual ideas um, that are actually in the statement itself. So the first question is, or I guess the first statement is, only Asian chefs, writers, hospitality staff should be able to profit off Asian cuisine. So I guess we'll start with Eska. Which one? <laughs> sorry, not to be on a spot, but like which one do you pick, I guess? Which number? Uh, it's a, I'm in between. It's a, it's a free for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think uh, everyone should be able to profit off uh, any cuisine or business that they, they, they believe in. And uh, yeah, as long as you do it right, I'm okay with that. Uh, and if not, maybe try something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, I would say I'm probably um, undecided slash or maybe towards agree. Um, I, again, I, I, you know, I hear what Eska is saying and I believe that if someone's working hard at a business then they absolutely deserve to profit off of it. But, you know, I think in this moment in time, there is this growing wave of awareness around uh, structural racism and white supremacy and how that pervades everything that we know and understand and the way that we live. Um, So we should be doing what we can to champion the work of minority groups or marginalised communities and uplift those people. And so I think that means that, you know, credit needs to be given, attention needs to be given to people of colour in the industry and those who are exploring their own culture and heritage through food. So I would say, yeah, I'm like in between. It's not an easy blanket statement to be able to agree or not to agree on it's all right we'll deep dive into it because i'm might be some other like rashani and celia might have a different opinion but um cecilia what do you think um i put down for number one strongly disagree um i would liken this to similar views that only chinese people being allowed to do chinese brush painting or only japanese people can do origami this of course has parallels to cultural appropriation for example, we make fun of Westerners wearing the sari or, or jiangsan. But here we are wearing Western clothes. Where do we draw the line? We live in a globalized world and the racial and ethnic makeup of many nation states are diverse. We borrow ideas in all spheres of life. It's a compliment that someone wants to ad- adapt our cuisine to theirs, right? If they don't cook it to your liking, show them. Um, I've got some more notes. I did a bit of research on that. Um, would you like me to... To read that? Yeah, if you would like to, but maybe um, we'll go to Roshani and I'll see what her, what she thinks first, and then we can open up the conversation. So Roshani, which one would you, I guess, correspond or relate um, number would you pick? A lot of, again, what has been said has resonated with me as well. Um, I would say number two, I disagree. Um, though ultimately I think there's a really fine line between appreciation and appropriation. Um, what we unfortunately do see a lot of in the West, there is a lot of appropriation. It's rife with it, but there is such a thing as appreciation. Um, And there are non-Asian chefs, writers and hospitality that do immerse themselves fully in in Asian cultures and and profit off it, but in an incredibly respectful way. I do understand where a lot of people are coming from here. Um, I agree that, you know, there's not equality. We're still really fighting to be heard and to have our cultures championed by ourselves. And that is very much a very real struggle. Um, But there are people that genuinely appreciate our cuisines that, um, have a place. Mm. 
Yeah. And I guess like going more on from that, and this is like open to anyone on the floor, but, you know, Australia is like kind of seen as a really multicultural country where we're really encouraged to embrace different food and like different cultural practices. But I guess in the modern Australia nowadays, it's very common for people from other cultures to open up, you know, restaurants or cook different foods than other people. So in that case, how can we really kind of try to balance that kind of appreciation appropriation debate rather than just saying straight off that only Asian people should profit off of Asian cuisine. And this is open up to everyone on the. Cecilia, did you have something to say or? Um, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, research on this. For example, food scholar Lucy Long in her work on culinary tourism offers a deeper, more integrated level of experiencing the other because it brings um, two cultures together by use of the senses of taste, smell, touch and vision. Then Amy Bentley examines how Mexican food in the southwest of the United States helps transform the exotic to familiar and the edible to uh, in it, the inedible to edible, an important transformation given that not long ago, Texas Anglos considered Mexican food unfit for human consumption. But I think that not everything is all lovely and positive, of course. The acceptance and ingesting of ethnic foods, in my opinion, does not preclude treating ethnic minorities as second-class citizens and preventing them from obtaining equal access to social educational or political life. So my take on this is that do profit from it. Cook the best dishes you came for excellence. You will only add to the richness of that cuisine, whether or not you were born into that culture. That something that you really brought up, Cecilia, was that like social justice, like oh, I guess injustice, the equality that while, you know, people, different people can cook different food, there is still that um, I guess minorities or people of color do get treated as second citizens in a way. And I guess um, this is, and maybe ignore my first question, but this question, like in that sense, how do you see that really impacting maybe in your workplace? Um, because all of you work in that food industry on different spectrums. Maybe it's more of a question for chefs. Oh, yeah, maybe, yeah, uh, as pushing your extra. What's the yeah, actual yeah, yeah, question? Like, like in, 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 in my first ever role as a head chef, yeah, I don't know why, but I've always just uh, looked for people that understand this Asian cuisine and somehow it's just always fallen to sort of, uh, yeah, the Asian chefs that, uh, that I can trust on, you know? Like, I feel like they just, it's like really um, second nature and easy to understand uh, for them. Uh, in what I'm trying to do, you know, and I want to impact them as much as uh, it's impacting me and inspire um, towards um, better Asian food and evolutionize uh, Asian food. And that's really important for me. But also, yeah, um, yeah, just trying to trying to educate each other, you know, like uh, it's nothing to do with profit in, in terms of uh, revenue, but yeah, profiting in uh, yeah knowledge and, and, and sort of culture and how they see things and and what we can do to better uh, um, whatever is uh, available right now. So, yeah, my, my kitchen is all Asian. <laughs> that. What was the, Could you clarify the question again, Michelle? It was really kind of looking at um, how this kind of second-class citizenry of people of color, um, how, how that impacts on your workplaces as a chef who is cooking, um, I guess, like food in general, because um, Cecilia made a really good point in how that, you know, everyone can cook different types of food, but the people whose cultures that food comes from aren't necessarily treated with the same respect or, um, I guess, dignity that that food, re I guess, respects. So I'm guessing how how does this manifest in your workplace? I, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't really, I'm not really clear on the question, but I guess if I'm to talk about my workplace and just kitchens generally, I, it is the, um, you know, minority groups that do, I think you can have as many like minority um, or marginalized identities in your kitchen and filling the spots and the lower kind of um, the, you know, the lower positions. But I think until you have the people, these marginalized identities at the, at the top and being looked to as authorities, like as Eska is, for example, um, and running the kitchens, then it, it's not really changing anything. And, you know, I think in this, in the hospitality climate right now, it's pretty hard to find anyone, but um, 
I think that I, I, yeah, I mean, it's what Eska said. I, I think that there is exchange both ways. You can learn from um, anybody that comes to work for you. Um, and I don't specifically make Asian food or Chinese food at Cafe Frida's. So I'm very open to um, whoever wants to work with me and wants to learn. Um, and likewise, I feel like I have a lot to learn from them as well. So I'm not sure if that actually answers the question that was asked, but um, there you go. I agree with you though, Shinny, that makes total sense. I think that we need more diversity in executive positions, not just within hospitality, but also food media, Mm. um, media in general, you know, it's incredibly white. Um, Mm. And as a result, this is why you see this, I guess, inequality within positions throughout hospitality and food media. Um, And you do unfortunately see, you know, first-generation migrants often pigeonholed into those lower-paid roles. Um, It is inherently racist. It it is an inherently racist country. Um, It's been proven time and time again that this is what happens to most you know, first gen migrants, uh, Asians, especially um, that we are pigeonholed into those kinds of roles. Yeah. Uh, so I think ultimately it does come, the onus is on our shoulders um, as second gen Asians or Asians in, in executive positions to ensure that we are hiring equally, but also providing that opportunity to people that we see fit um, might be POC, you know, um, and distributing that that power evenly as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the onus is just on our shoulders either. It's no, on, it's certainly the onus not. Of everybody and like white people and white chefs as well. And you know, 100%. Maybe, maybe people will, maybe like operators of restaurants or owners of restaurants will feel like they're taking a chance on someone who isn't like a, a celebrity or well known white right male chef because those are the, the kinds of chefs that have come up in the world and that we see and know. But, but that's the problem is that they're not giving those opportunities to, um, yeah, people of colour as much. Yeah. And sorry, I have a question for Cecilia um, and maybe Roshani can answer this as well So because both of you work in that writing publishing sphere. But I guess in guess of like those um, more white chefs who kind of do profit off like Asian cuisine in the form of like recipes or like books, like how do, how do you see that um like, do you think that is inherently problematic or do you think that is more of a case of they're just appreciating the culture, um, uh, I guess, in that form by, I guess, releasing their, their interpretation of, of how they would, you know, represent Asian cuisine? Um, and I guess open to anyone, but maybe Cecilia or Shani can answer um, this. I think Neil Perry has done a fantastic job in attributing his success in creating the so-called modern Australian cuisine by acknowledging that his first love of Asian food was uh, to Chinese restaurants in Chinatown with his dad when he was a little boy. Um, So time and time again, he's um, referred back to that time. That was his happy time and, and his love for Asian ingredients grew and that contributed to to his success. But um, can I say a bit about food and racism? So it's very interesting that when early Chinese, especially in the gold fields and in the um, 19th, 20th centuries, um, Chinese who faced racism from mainstream Australians, they were seen as dirty and poor and disgusting. And yet time and time again, they um, ingest the food cooked by Chinese, prepared by Chinese. So that's um, something interesting. Yeah, I guess just going back to your question really quickly, um, in terms of the publishing industry, namely, I guess, media and also book publishing, um, we're starting to see a big shift in terms of consumer behaviour, which is great. We're starting to see that diversity is something, obviously, that's being heralded a lot more than it was a few years ago, right? Um, There's a lot of different reasons for that, but the flow on effect that that has on publishing means that people are hungry for authenticity, you know, whatever that is, but also seeking, you know, for example, Cantonese cookbooks published by Chinese people. There is a real hunger for that. And there is a lot of questioning around authors that don't pertain to that culture and cuisine nowadays. So there is definitely a a shift there. Um, In terms of, appropriation versus appreciation again when it comes to 
books, for example. Um, one such person that I actually admire who is white is Fuchsia Dunlop, who was what, the first Westerner to, to train um, as a chef at the, I think it's the Sichuan Chengdu Institute, um, which is pretty remarkable. And she went on to create some pretty incredible cookbooks, um, incredibly respectful of the culture and the cuisine, uh, constantly referencing it, um, hasn't plagiarised anything, so to speak. And I think that's appropri- that's appreciation, not appropriation. Appropriation is what we see time and time again, um, authors or chefs or whoever just being like, I like that culture, I don't belong to it, but I'm going to go and write a cookbook on it and they have no connection to it or just someone being like, but my husband's Indian so I can go and make an Indian cookbook. And it's like, mm. can you? Can you really? Mm. Um, so I guess that's, that's the, the difference there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that the the big difference for me is like have has whoever is cooking the food or writing the article, have they done the work to to understand the culture? Have they really like immersed themselves into it? Have they have they just researched and studied as much as possible? Um, and by doing so, then they're demonstrating a great respect for that culture and that cuisine. And I think that's kind of moving towards yeah. Sorry, the I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and that's just, I think, moving more towards the appreciation versus the appropriation kind of aspect, which would be when you you are not, you're, you're just benefiting from it on your kind of flattening, flattening like a multitude of cultures into one kind of Asian cuisine and then therefore profiting off it or like, you know, playing into harmful stereotypes. Yeah, certainly, especially not to do so in consultation with someone of that culture if you're really dead set on representing that cuisine in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. And um, I'm, not sure, I'm not familiar with, um, I guess, the kind of dynamics that are in, uh, uh, I guess, a restaurant or in a cafe. Um, and maybe this question is really more directed towards, um, I guess, Eska and Cecilia. Like, Cecilia, you're one of the, I think, very few Asian food historians in Australia, despite Asian cuisine being quite prevalent and influential in the, uh, I guess, the food scene in Australia. And Eska, you talked about having like an all or majority Asian place, but have you kind of, how has that, has that really isolated you in the sense that like you are one like of the few or like the minority that is, I guess, paving way in the sense for, um, more like cultural understanding or I guess less appreci- uh, less appropriation than appreciation? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, it's appropriation and appreciation at the same time. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just, yeah, cooking stuff that I, I really am familiar with and I want to sort of share my love and educate people on uh, this, this special cuisine, you know. it's uh, For me, I see it as one. Um, Asian cuisine from all corners are... Are represented can be represented in one um and yeah it's uh yeah it's it's i'm in between so yeah what about you cecilia um so in the university environment i'm a food historian i study in the uh, discipline of history and we are very diverse we do all kinds of history now i haven't faced anything negative in that respect if anything more interesting however i must stress that my PhD was on the British colonial hybrid cuisine in the three colonies of Malaysia, Singapore, and India, and not directly on Asian foods, although the hybrid cuisine was a combination of European and Asian elements. So I was looking more from a social and cultural historical uh, perspective and not strictly, um, I'm not a culinary historian, that is the study of um, ingredients or cooking methods and so on. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think it can be isolating in a way, but I think it just shows that we probably need more people because I think definitely maybe from a food history background to understand the culture and the the hu- really human impact on food and on culture and society sometimes does need that perspective from a person from that particular culture or someone that really has experienced that personally because it is very different for people who are removed from that culture to really write about that. So, yeah, it's really interesting what you're doing, Cecilia. And I guess we 
We appreciate you for what you're doing and hopefully continue that good work. Um, so the next statement is, there is no such thing as the original or traditional recipe. It's a bit spicy. Gosh, um, this is a very interested and interesting and multifaceted question. Um, I would maybe say I'm between three and four um, in that Recipes are just a, a way of, of communicating, a way of writing something, a, a method down, right? It's just a way of scribing that. Before we had recipes, we would just do a bit of this, a bit of that, or go on, you know, watch your mother or whoever cook and, and learn. That's way, the way we would learn. But I guess now everything's changed and now we, we write. We've got social media. We use the internet, you know. We need that information fast. We can get recipes from any culture, cuisine, at any time we want. So it's completely different the way that we ingest food. It's completely changed um, so I think looking at original traditional recipe back then, it's no, there wasn't because every family would change from family to family, right? A recipe. If you look at it now, when we look at plagiarism and things like that. Well, then that's totally different because now we sell cookbooks and we make profit off it. It's a commercial thing, right? And then we have problems with people that appropriate foods like cough, Alison Roman cough, um, with, uh, spiced chickpeas stew and gentle lentils and all that BS, um, <laughs> you know, that then there was a traditional recipe that was effectively plagiarised with apparently not being plagiarised. So that's why I'm a bit three and four on this um, because it really depends on the situation and what we're talking about here. That's yeah. it. That's a really good um, point. I think there's a huge, there's like, I guess, two points in that, like what is original, what is traditional? And then the second part being, I guess, plagiarism and the current contemporary complexities of having written words and, you know, what you said, like commercializing of that, which obviously there's like IP intellectual property and all that. And that's really interesting. Um, I picked four. Um, so when we talk about recipes, we refer to written or published instructions for cooking particular dishes. These, of course, are derived from oral recipes from cooked, whether in the home kitchen or in the eatery. So I'm treading on Roshani's ground here now. Um, so recipes are not covered under intellectual property laws and therefore are not copyright protected. A list of ingredients required for a dish or the basic instructions for Preparing it are considered mere factual information. As we know this year, yes, this year or last year, London-based chef Elizabeth Hayes' new book, Makan, um, Recipes from the Heart of Singapore, was withdrawn by his publisher, Bloomsbury Absolute. Hayes' sin was in plagiarizing the anecdotes and narratives in Sharon Wee's growing up in a Nyonya kitchen and not from copying the recipe. Outside of copyright concerns, though, we seem to think that only published recipes are worth arguing over. Many cookery authors like to claim that a particular recipe is from a grandmother from some distant village, self-praising that he or she went to great lengths to source that recipe from said grandmother. Frequently, that distant grandmother remains nameless. So the cookbook authors claim authenticity of speaking from a position of knowledge and authority. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Cecilia. I think we can start to sense a common theme here. Um, like, I think we definitely know a few people, like, whether they're chefs or I guess self-proclaimed foodies who've been to a country and said, I have the original or the authentic recipe. And that, I think that in itself, the wording is problematic um, when you think about it, because you, you, especially if you're, I guess, white or not from that culture and you put a label of authentic on it, you know, like what really is authentic if you are not the spokesperson or from that culture. Um, so I guess, but yeah, that's just something food for thought for the panelists, but we'll go to Shingi next. Um, yeah, I guess I, I looked at this. I probably focused less on the, the word recipe um, than Cecilia and Roshani did and just thinking more about like this idea of originality or traditional dishes. Um, and I would say that I'm probably like the same kind of between three and four. Um, I think that there might have been an originating country or culture from which a dish originated from, but to say that there is a one original recipe 
from which all recipes of that dish came from is I think ignoring the fact that many people at a certain time would be cooking a dish in a different way and that's going to be traditional to them and it's going to be traditional to the culture and cuisine of which they're cooking as well. So, you know, I think this conversation ties into the discussion about authenticity as well, which is like super loaded. But I think what I'm what I'm trying to say about authenticity is that it's it's subjective and it's it's uh, also not static and it changes um, depending on who is talking about it and who is cooking a dish. So yeah, thanks, Shingi. I think that yeah, there is a wider concept of like what is authentic. I think the word recipe can be. I think loosely used, like some people when they refer to recipe mean like a written down version or when people mean recipe could just mean an oral recipe. And I think that's something that's really interesting because in a lot of Asian cultures, oral history is really important and Mm. oral history or oral communication is the way that culture has been kind of passed down through generations. So that's like a really interesting way to kind of think about like it's an oral, comes from a specific culture in a country, but it doesn't mean it's the original. It just means it's from that place. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and l- lucky last, Eska. Uh, yeah. For me, I think uh, I'd be like between one and two. I strongly disagree. I think there is a oh. original traditional recipe out there, but you can never find it. It's always evolving and it's always whispered away. There is definitely a sense of a traditional way or traditional idea. And uh, yeah, it's always evolving. But yeah, it's, it's both. You have both, you know. It's always a traditional original recipe out there. Uh, in different households and you know it's all based that one idea uh, but it's always evolving so yeah then again you can never trace it back Um, but yeah we are in the era of like always progressing and always uh, um, you know um, taking on things and changing and depending on what's trending or what's new or what's around us it's it's moving it's moving uh, very fast and uh, uh, but I do agree there there is a there is such thing as traditional recipes and the OG ways for sure. So then I guess my question is to all you panelists and opening up the floor for discussion is, is original or traditional the same thing as being authentic? No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just sad to say it. Sorry. Authentic Authentic (laughs) is the white gaze. Mm. That's what I see authentic as. Traditions are passed down, Mm. but authenticity is BS. Mm. Could you like elaborate more on the white gaze? Because I think some people in our audience might not know what that is. So. Yeah, sure. It's the white gaze is if you, if you look at authenticity, for example, to the lens of the white gaze. Um, authenticity is a term that white people or colonizers or whatever you want to call them would de- use to kind of measure um, Asian cuisine, for example, and say what they feel is authentic or what is inauthentic. And what is authentic, according to the white gaze, is the kinds of foods that are most commonly eaten here. So, you know, a lot of that does happen to be Cantonese and through the gold rush, a lot of that changed. And so it's like, you know, sweet sour pork and honey chicken and fried rice, that's what is authentic, right? But it does not take into consideration any regionality, traditions, cultures. It erases all of that. That's what authenticity is. Um, It doesn't allow us to provide a modern interpretation of our cuisines either, which is I know a lot of what you both do as chefs as well. It doesn't allow us to break through that as well if we want to. That's what authenticity does puts us in a box i mean i think it's it's kind of what i mentioned before it's a very subjective thing which is i think kind of playing off what rashani was saying about it being the white gaze you know it is it kind of it's based on the idea that things are really static and that things don't evolve and so if something's authentic then it that's just that's just the authentic version and there's no diversion any diversion of that is then inauthentic but that's not true because cuisines and cultures they evolve and they change and um there's many different kinds of like authentic cultures and authentic foods and so you know in the way that chinese chinese food has evolved as as it's moved around the world like what is the original traditional recipe is that the 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 original recipe that was found in a village in china but then as it's moved to America or as it's moved to Australia and it's people have cooked it in a different way based on the ingredients that they have in that country and the necessity of doing so. Does that 
mean it's like less authentic? I don't think so. I think it it's actually a very authentic reflection of a time and place and just what is, yeah, what's available. So I think it, the question is like, does it make sense and does it reflect that time, that place and that person who's doing it in a genuine way is how I would say what authenticity is. Yeah. I think um, authenticity um, is, is, is a bit problematic with food because how far back do you want to go? Um, for the first coffee drink that was accidentally or not devised by goat herds in Ethiopia by roasting some coffee beans and grinding it and um, pouring hot water over it. And now we are flat white and this and that. So where, where do we go? What is the authentic um, coffee? What is authentic coffee? And I find particularly with coffee drinkers in Australia, we travel thousands of miles away from Australia to criticize about other people's uh, coffee. French coffee is not good enough. American coffee is shit and the rest of it. No, I think that's something a lot of, I think particularly Melbournians can agree with because there is a lot of good, I don't drink coffee, but I've heard there's a lot of good coffee in Melbourne, but I'm not sure of that itself because the country, the world is such a big place as well. And I actually kind of want to go to Eska, which is because he's the one, I guess, not to pick on you, um, who I guess disagreed that there is actually such thing as an original or traditional recipe. But in that, in your restaurant, or I guess um, in the food that you cook, how do you retain? that, I guess, authentic or original, I guess, um, context of the food while making it like contemporary, if you get yeah, what I it's mean. it's hard. It's hard, yeah. Because uh, like, like what I'm trying to do is um, sort of elevate and uh, uh, show people a different interpretation of um, of a classic dish, you know. Yeah, but what what is the OG classic dish, you know? It can be cold, it can be hot. Who knew? Like, who knows? What is chicken rice meant to be cold, uh, served cold or hot? I don't know. Um, so yeah, like for me, I can only uh, sort of imagine and try to give you the best version uh, that can sort of uh, show you how it's how it was formed, how traditional elements in at that time of place can be, you know, sort of uh, shown in this modern world today. So it's a hard thing to to puzzle. Like for example, we have a dish called nanura right now. And basically, it's a dish that was uh, smothered with spice paste um, and marinated uh, sort of overnight. Um, it's it's a way for the North Sumatrans to protect the fish and um, to to save it and to not have wastage and to have you know continuous uh, dinner nights, you know, with uh, with whatever food they have, right? Um, so I guess I'm just sort of like I said, you know, there is a traditional OG recipe out there. Like nothing's created without the first 1.0. But what I can do is sort of uh, carry you through with uh, the traditional ways and sort of uh, guide you how this dish was created and why it was there and why we should still appreciate it right now. You know, um, yeah, just trying to represent uh, dishes that are sort of forgotten and and about to be lost and. Uh, um, and that's the only thing I can do right now because, uh, yeah, we, we can never find the original recipe. Yeah, it's just too, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult task. Yeah. So it's always evolving, always moving forward. And all we can do is sort of, um, cherish the moment it was created and, and, uh, take us through to, to, to the end of time. I think you have nailed it. Um, do the best you can cook the best you can do your research and that's your authenticity. Yeah. This, I don't know. I don't know if this dish is meant to be like that, but I'm mm-hmm. telling you a story, and hopefully you can do your own research and you can tell me if, it's, if I'm wrong or right. Mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, it's a start of something, right? It's a start of mm-hmm. a, a, an idea, a topic. Uh, yeah, is it right mm-hmm. or is it wrong? Is it real or is it fake? Is it traditional or is it non-traditional? Mm-hmm. Let's all figure it out together. I think it's definitely a journey that some people don't necessarily think deeply on because I think with food, especially a lot of us just consume it and be like, oh, okay, is, is this authentic or not? Oh, if it's authentic, I'll just come back right and eat it because I like the food. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think there's something, especially, and this is kind of goes on to the next question that we're about to go on to, but maybe I'll ask it as like a sub question is like, I think, do you think there is an authenticity issue within the Asian community itself? Because I do know a lot of, I guess, Asian communities or Asian individuals who are like, "Mm, I'm not going to this restaurant because their food is catering to white people, like the white version of like this cuisine. And I don't want want that. I want authentic, you know, food from my culture. Do you think there's this problem that exists within the Asian community? And this is open to everyone as well. Yeah, I myself would not go to an 
a Chinese restaurant in the suburbs. Oh, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> uh, because it's catering mainly to middle class Australians who wants to in sour pork and chop suey and the other stuff. Mm. Mm. Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were in the Chinese restaurant uh, last night. In Cantonese, summer. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was delicious. It must be an up market one. It was, um, <laughs> there was no sweet and sour pork. <laughs> Did you order it? <laughs> no, not for me. Sorry, I totally blanked on my answer to your question. Uh, <laughs> can you ask it again? Sorry. It was, it was about like the authenticity the concept of authenticity in the Asian pro- Asian yes. community, whether that's a problem itself. Like what you just said, um, is it like yeah. a double standard in a way? Because we, we just I, talked about evolving and then Cecilia said, oh, I wouldn't go to the suburbs because there's a, you know, the, the food caters for like, I guess, more wider or non-Asian yeah. population. So is there like a problem with the Asian community? I itself? think it depends on the individual and the way that they construe, for example, going back to that appreciation appropriation, as long as you're not... Um, vilifying people that don't belong to a certain culture that are trying to champion that culture respectfully. I think then that becomes a slight issue depending on your mindset. But um, I don't think in general there's a problem with you seeking comfort food from your cuisine um, from particular restaurants that you know that you're going to get that, you know, because like Cecilia said, unfortunately it is a problem that a lot of restaurants are catering to the white palate um, and that's just the way it is. Um, so I don't particularly see a huge problem with uh, seeking the comfort food and creature comforts. I'm not sure about that. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I would appreciate going to a Chinese restaurant in the suburbs or in a um, Chinese, you know, like in a small town in the middle of Australia, because I think that would be interesting to see how they've had to interpret Chinese food for the, the market there. Um and so, you know, I think everything is, I think everything is a reflection of someone, someone's like uh, exploration of their identity or their culture in some way, I'd like to think. I think it's a very complicated and loaded like question because again, like authenticity means different things to different people. And I think sometimes Asians tend to overgeneralize too much. They're like all Cantonese food or all Malaysian food or all Indian food should taste the same. But like if take, for example, like India is the whole country is a British construct, but like it is so it's so based on regional regionality. Like everywhere you go, we'll have a different interpretation of a dish and everyone's idea of authentic will be different. And I guess that goes into the next question, which is, the Asian community and or individuals are too protective over their food culture. Um, I think everyone at some point has probably gone to a restaurant and said like, this is not authentic enough or this is terrible. Um, or, you know, they've criticized someone watching on TV, like that's not the way you cook that food. But I guess there are ups and downs to this and that's why this question is there. So um, we'll go reverse order again because I'm trying to Jazz it up. So sorry, Rashani. Um, we'll go the other way. The next question. So like, be prepared, Eska. But yeah, Rashani <laughs> will go first. Yeah. Um, I would probably see uh, say, say sorry number three. I'm undecided because whilst I think there's definitely instances where the Asian community or individuals can be too protective over the food culture and isolate people that they might see as you know for example um does anyone know about the god of cookery and that whole saga um there's a a man clarence um he had this huge social media following he's a brand executive um and his whole thing was about calling out cultural appropriation to the point where he became a bully. Um, he would bully people uh, like this um, Korean man who was a chef, Korean chef in the US. He was adopted. His name is Eric Ella. And he full on said, you're not Asian. You can't be doing this, blah, blah, blah. And just like bullied him. Um, that kind of behavior is not okay. Um, But then the flip side to that kind of behavior is the reason, the question, why are we feel, why are we so protective over our food and our cuisines? Well, the reason is colonization, racism, a lot of that. And I think that that is totally valid as to why we feel that way and why we are protective. So I feel like it's a two pronged kind of question or issue. Um, That's why I'm kind of undecided. Does that make sense? No, that makes sense. Um, Cecilia? Um, I'm going for number two just because I can't see that being articulated 
um, blatantly all over the place. Perhaps we just mutter under our breath, "Ah, oh, no, that's not how you make sushi, or that's not real curry. This idea that we are protective of our one's food culture is not limited to Asian. In 2015, Jamie Oliver created a huge controversy in Portugal when he cooked his version of one of the most popular dishes of Portugal, bacalhau a brass. It is salted cod cooked with potatoes, eggs, onions, olives, parsley and garlic. The Portuguese disputed the authenticity of it and many volunteered to teach him how to cook it properly. So I don't think it's limited to, to Asians because each culture has its own cuisine. Culture thinks that um, any outsider who tries to, to prepare food from that cuisine is not the best person. So, yeah, so I can't say that I agree with the statement. There is a lot of parallels to be drawn with other specific cultural cuisines like I think one culture that I think very, is very protective of is Italians uh, I'm not sure if any of you've been on YouTube but there's a lot of like real Italian chef reacting to carbonara recipe or like real real Italian chef actually reacts to I don't know like bolognese recipe and I guess that's something um I guess food for thought for you guys so when we open up the discussion is like do our, I guess, I mean, Asian community is really big, but like other specific with like communities in the Asian community that are really protective over their food culture. Um, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm not sure. So I guess we'll go to Xingyi next. Um, I would probably say that I am, I disagree as well. Number two, uh, a lot of what's been said. So what Rashani was saying about the, the reasons for being too protective, um, are true. I think food is extremely important and personal to a lot of people. And it's the way that someone can feel connected to the cultural country in which they grew up, but they're disconnected from. So I think people have a right to feel protective about it um, because it's very personal. So I, yeah, I would say I disagree. And also, again, what Cecilia said about like, it's not just the Asian community, it's just communities all over the world. Um, and I don't think that's a problem. I think it, it's actually great to see people engaging and feeling, you know, connected to their their um, cultural culture and identity in that way. No, I think that's definitely like a legitimate answer. Um, some places where there is less Asian food or less food of that specific culture that one restaurant that exists like in regional Victoria is like the only cultural food experience that some Chinese people or Asian people might get. And um, even though if it's like terrible food, it's the only experience that they can get, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. And so you make a very good point in that it's like, it's, it does legitimize people's experiences that way. Um, yeah. And lastly, Eska. Uh, yeah. I'm sitting on a two. I disagree. Um, I think, yeah, it's just, yeah, I'm in between, in between and disagree. It's like, uh, I agree with uh, Sinyi saying that, uh, yeah, they have every right to, um, be protective about it and be sensitive to to how this dish is done or uh, what goes in the food um, back to sort of uh, the traditional what uh, recipe that they think it is like. But uh, for me, I'm OK. Like as long as it's, uh, it's tasty and it's generous, like for me, flavor, deliciousness, hospitality is there. I'm, I'm OK. I'm forgiving, you know. Um, but yeah, like there, there is um, people that are uh, t just like disrespecting the, the cuisine and I get upset, to be honest with you. Um, the fine dining chefs that say that this is Chinese food or this is Malaysian food. It's not like uh, can you just respect uh, the way it has been or the traditional way it's been done? And, and it's OK, you know, like try to interpret that in a different way by keeping that uh, that sense in there. And um, yeah, and I'll be OK with that. So, yeah, I am a bit protective, but not over the board. Uh, as long as uh, it's um, it's acceptable on both parties. It, yeah, I'm OK with that. So, yeah. No, that's definitely I think it is a way of like protecting your culture, especially like in a country, like you said, Rashani, where inherently racist structures are trying to like kind of oppress and like repress some of that cultural nuances or like, I guess, oversimplify the cultural nuances that minority groups come from. So like connecting, I guess, protection is like a form of like defense in that, that we do want to protect and retain our culture and authenticity, I guess, to that extent. But um, a question I have for all of you is, is there, I think there is this kind of sentiment among like Asian communities that we are like, oh, if you go to this restaurant, they have the most like authentic place or like that, don't go to that place. That place is terrible food. Um, but do you think this is counterproductive to, I guess, building a more multicultural or like um, 
yeah, counterproductive to building a more multicultural society or increasing intercultural understanding? I think it definitely depends on the context again, but say, for example, just kind of touching on what Eska mentioned before, like fusion, for example, um, and fusion versus authenticity. Asians can, and not just Asians, and this applies to any community, people can gatekeep within their own communities, right? And if someone disagrees with the concept of fusion, they're like, no, I only want authentic food or traditional food, then, yeah, they could give someone a bad review or be like, no, you shouldn't go to that restaurant because they do fusion or, or that person wasn't even born in X country. They're, you know, a second gen or that's, that there are those stereotypes and there are those issues that exist within our own communities and, you know, we can't deny that. So I, I firmly do believe that you can be protective in that sense. Um, that's that's my two cents on that. I, I've personally been attacked for that. Uh, like <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. Borneo. Uh, I'm I am Asian. Uh, I'm just I'm born there. I'm trying to represent Borneo on a, on a plate. Uh, but you know, I get reviews like uh, this guy's from Borneo. He's cooking Asian food. It's not Asian food. It's not Borneo food. Yeah. Like, see. I just, <laughs> I'm just trying to yeah. share and educate, you know, I'm not telling you this is, this is what it is, but, uh, but yeah, I get, I get people beat up, be, beating me, me up for that. Yeah. I take it with a pinch of salt and uh, yeah, move on. But I think generally when you look at restaurant reviews online and elsewhere, the critics mainly about whether the food is excellent, whether it was bad food, um, whether it was flavorsome, sometimes a bit of um, racism creeps in. And a bit of, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that it has a lot to do with critiquing about where you come from. Although at the same time, um, we have to acknowledge that people would say, oh, don't go to that uh, sushi place because the chefs, they are from Malaysia. And yeah. look at the waiters and waitresses. They're all from China or elsewhere. No one is from Japan. How can it yeah. be sushi? Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. By doing that, we're then again pigeonholing ourselves into only being able to champion our own cuisine and yeah. therein lies the problem for sure like I, I i had a i had a dish uh on the menu on the summer menu uh so basically it's a dish based on ban xiao. so basically ban xiao is made from a, a, a batter that's sizzling in the wok basically like a lace um and i served my modern version to um a vietnamese uh, diner um, and she was old school, so she sort of uh, giggled and laughed and said that this is not Ban Xiao, it's what I heard. But hey, man, you know, just uh, just give me a pat on the back for trying to reinterpret your classic dish and try to educate people and share um, a, a future generation kind of view, you know. Um, I'm not telling you this is how it's meant to be done, but yeah, you can see people are protective of what a dish is meant to be in in how they were brought up with that dish so it's uh you know you're, you're right in that way but you know you gotta open your mind yeah i think that's definitely a big i think a sentiment that a lot of us are, are guilty of i don't think it's a wrong sentiment at times i think it's just a product of us having to again like live in a society where we are have to protect our culture and which is unfortunate and that we can't express it in the way that we want to. Like many people in the comments and I'm not sure if they're in the house in the comments, but a lot of them have been talking about, you know, having examples of people not eating certain foods unless it's being cooked by this specific person or unless it's being cooked by this specific restaurant or things like that. And I think it's like, hard like i want to ask the question this is a lot less like right or wrong but what are some ways i guess that you know some asian individuals or people can be open-minded about you know different interpretations of a food like eska like what would you say to like people who would come to your restaurant and say like you know this is not bun tiao yeah i'll just say um i'm not trying to do a classic dish for you um i'm just trying to evolve and and see how far this dish can go you know uh, I have by no means know what is the right bun xiao or the right uh, chicken rice or a uh, sort of noodle dish. But hey, man, just respect that people are trying to uh, take a movement and, and do something and, and and grow this this dish, you know, because if it's just like that, it's it's done and dusted. Then how can we how can we grow into the future? So I just ask people to be open minded and forgiving and just to sort of uh, understand a young chef's mind and and, uh, and 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 mission. You know, my mission is to create uh, a new genre and um, elevate Asian food and say like, hey, it's okay to work with time and place. It's okay to merge all Asian dishes together and have it all in one. You know. Yeah. 
I, I feel like a lot of people forget, um, we're just listening to you speak, Esco. I, I feel like, like you, I use food as like a way to explore and experiment. And um, it's the way that I connect with like my identity or culture or whatever. And what I do, I'm not you know, professing that it's right or wrong or it's the best or anything. I know it's not. And I know that there's so much to learn and there always will be. So when people come in and they're like, well, that's not the way it should be. It's like, well, I'm not you know, we are individuals as well. And we are all learning all the time. Do you expect us? I'm not trying to pretend that I'm making like the best fun show or like the perfect rendering. Like that's not even possible. So if you come to the restaurant, you have to kind of like, be like, yeah, I am coming to eat this person's interpretation and exploration of a dish or a cuisine. And that's it. Like that's not, there's nothing else to that. If someone is pretending on the other hand, that this is, this is the, um, you know, epitome of Vansia, then, then sure, I think they're opening themselves up to a lot of criticism. And um, I don't think Eska nor I are doing that <laughs> in any way. <laughs> yeah, well, well said. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, like, if you're looking for a straight up, uh, simple, well made Vansia, then yeah, you know where to go, you know where mm. to find. It. But yeah, we need we need different interpretations and different road um, roads to, to, yeah, just, you know, it's, it's art. It's, uh, you know, who, Who's to say Ban Xiao has always been like that? You know, maybe it wasn't like that before. Maybe it wasn't folded. Maybe it was like flat on the top, you know. Who knew? Who knows? Mm. So, yeah, just just appreciate uh, what's happening right now around your area. And, yeah, you know, because that Ban Xiao might not come back again. So <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, definitely like a very... I think people forget that the people cooking the food are trying their best sometimes to represent or what they interpret as what the best interpretation of this dish is. And I think especially in a world that's powered by the consumer, it can be difficult to kind of please everyone in that sense. And you're always going to have critics who are going to say, you know, this is not the original or like, you know, you've essentially like uh, smeared the cuisine of this. I'm never coming again. And I think it's very hard. And I think, and I can't speak obviously on behalf of you, Shingi or Eska, but like, I feel like, I feel sorry for the chef sometimes because they put a lot of love and labor into the food that they're cooking. And then someone just like, no, nope, you, did, you did the wrong thing. Like immediately I'm not coming back. Um, yeah. It's yeah. A very, it's a very, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I just, think, I just think they should really appreciate that Asians are trying to elevate Asian or show their own perspective. Because like if a white person did it and they'll be like, oh, it's OK because he's white. He doesn't understand. We'll we'll we'll, we'll forget about it. But if an Asian mm. does it, it's like massacre. <laughs> mm. How can you do this to Asian food? You're Asian. Um, and yeah, they just need to open up a bit. Yeah, I think there's um, really different standards that uh, people hold white chefs versus um, chefs of marginalized identities. Um, mm. If you're white, well, white, pe- white chefs generally are given more of a, a pass to explore and experiment with different cuisines than they have in the past. And, you know, maybe it's been called out a bit more. Whereas like if you're Asian, if you're Chinese then people look at you and they're like, oh, you cook Chinese food, right? Or you're from Borneo. Oh, you must cook the best Borneo food. And it's like, no, I actually don't cook that much Asian Chinese food. <laughs> I've actually only recently started cooking Chinese food as a way to kind of learn more about my culture. But because I don't fit that mold of um, being a, a, a Chinese chef or a chef cooking Chinese food, then people don't really know what to do with that. And, mm. and so you kind of just get like, there's just this kind of pigeonholing of Asian chefs like, oh, you're Asian, you cook Asian food. And it's like, no, we're all made up of all of the different experiences that we have in our lives, including living a lot of our lives in Australia. And so our food is a reflection of that and people should respect that and should understand mm-hmm. that there's there's more complexity to like the 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 um, Asian experience in Australia than than what I think is given or assumed. In the sense that like how Asians can be more open-minded when going to restaurants, when we go to like, I guess when Asian people go to fusion restaurants, how can we, I guess, be resilient or I guess <laughs> try to help with that emotional uh, labor that we have to do when trying to explain why this food isn't like the food that we normally eat. Uh, I'm not sure if I phrase that question right. Um, but normally, like when I guess people go to or you know, people minority backgrounds go to like a fusion restaurant of that food, they're, they're like, oh, this food isn't the right way to cook it or stuff. How do how can we, I guess, 
help cope with that emotional labor to actually explain that to people who don't understand. Because I think a lot of people find that quite emotionally taxing to actually having to explain why it's not the way it is. Sorry, I don't know if I... (laughs) Who would you be explaining that to? Because if it's emotionally taxing, I'd assume that you're referring to someone pertaining to that culture, for example, if it's Bense or something, it's a Vietnamese person trying to explain to who about it. Sorry, who's the audience in that in that situation? Yeah, I think it's more about like, um, I guess, speaking to the mainstream audience, which is like white people. Like, how would you, I guess, help cope with that emotional labor that you do have to explain to people that this is not the way that it's supposed to be done? Because I think there are a few restaurants out there that do really cater to that wider audience. But then a lot of the reviews say, you know, this is not authentic. And then most of them are actually written by people of color, but that is a lot, a lot of emotional labor that is being put out there. So how do, I guess, how do you, with that coping of emotional question. I'm not very good at explaining myself, but that it's kind of like that concept. I don't think it's anyone's responsibility necessarily to make a judgment call on that for anyone else. I think people can go to a restaurant and they can you can enjoy it for many different reasons. And if someone feels the need to go out and say that this isn't authentic or this isn't worth going to and talk about why, then, I mean, sure, they can do that, but it's not anyone's responsibility to then argue back why. It's like everyone just has a different experience when they go to eat. Um, mm-hmm. I don't even know if that's answering your question, but... I think the emotional labor, it's, you have to draw boundaries on how much you're going to put of yourself out there when, when it's like when you receive bad reviews, it's like how much you're going to let them affect you. Yeah, it's going to fucking suck, but sorry, excuse my mm-hmm. language, but um, mm-hmm. you have to just draw a boundary around that and realize that everyone has different, comes from a different place and has different expectations. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with Chinyi. A lot of the time, the emotional labor does fall back on the shoulders of POC to educate a, a mainstream audience on why it is we do things differently or when we do question that concept of authenticity, it always falls back on our shoulders. But I agree, it doesn't necessarily need to. You can just tell them to use Google. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I guess, wondering, um, Cecilia, have you ever encountered having to do some of that emotional labor? Uh, in your field as a food historian to maybe non-Asians who don't necessarily understand the cultural nuances? Not not really. I, I still don't quite get the question about emotional labor, like as yourself as a customer, are you saying? I, yeah, so as someone who like consumes food commercially, which I guess is a customer, yeah. No, I can't say I've um, encountered that. Like if I ate at a restaurant, if it was good, I'd go back. If it's not good, I won't go back. I I won't put too much um, emotional labor into that. It's just like uh, buying a pair of shoes whether I like them or not. What Shingy said about putting boundaries is really important because I think it's like for you, Cecilia, like some people just may not choose to engage in that discourse. It might just be like, I'm just not going to go back. And then I think other people feel they need to go and actually say something because that's how they feel inside and they need to get it out. So I think it's interesting that there's like different approaches to it because um, I think there is like, I think Roshani said this, like there is a more, there's a consciousness in the consumer now that they are wanting more food from people actually cooking, like people from that specific culture. And I think that is becoming this, this idea of like, who is actually doing the emotional labor to explain all of this is like another important thing. Cause again, like you run into the risk of having um, non-Asians explaining what authentic is again, or what is non-authentic. And then the whole kind of cycle goes like again, starts from the beginning. Yeah. It's like the cycle, and yeah. That's why we need more Asians in food media. <laughs> yeah. It's not enough that they're in mainstream food media, um, and you know that impacts the way a place is reviewed and critiqued, yeah. mm-hmm. because often what you'll see are reviews that have no understanding of the culture, the cuisine, the techniques that have gone into a dish. Um, And there's this huge disconnect. And, again, going back to authenticity and what they believe authenticity to be Mm -hmm. is often just this huge stereotype, which is why we need more Asians in food media. I agree. I agree. (laughs) Oh, my God. Definitely. (laughs) <laughs> um, and for everyone's reference, um, I think Lee, if anyone knows Lee, Lee Lam Tran runs Lee Tran Lam. Oh, Lee Tran Lam, sorry, um, 
runs diversity in food media. And she's a great person. Um, go to their website, diversity in food media to read more about that. But the last question is there is a distinct Asian Australian food identity. So we'll go from Escar first. I agree. I think there is an identity, but I'm still not too sure what it is. Cause I was, I'm, 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 uh, I came here when I was 15 and I started to uh, sort of figure out what is Asian Australian like at the mid age of like 25. So I'm 30 now, I'm still discovering, but I believe there is one. So maybe perhaps maybe you guys can sort of clarify for me what it is. I believe there is though. <laughs> um, and then Hoshi. So you yeah, no, that's right. I, <laughs> I, I'm undecided. I don't think that it's very easy to define a an Asian Australian food identity. First of all, Asian is such a broad term and encompasses so many countries that I, I kind of have a bit of an issue with using it. So uh, the, the the frequency with it with which we use it, and also every individual's experience with Australia is different. Like when did they come here? Um, when did what kind of food did they grow up eating, etc. So there is probably a food identity, an Asian Australian food identity, but I would have no idea how to define it. Um, so I strongly disagree. To reduce Asia or Asian to one monolithic mass is an affront to the 5 billion people of the Asian continent. There are no less than 48 nation states in Asia with 2,300 spoken languages. Within Chinese cuisine, there are dozens of regional or provincial dishes and indeed cuisines that have vastly different ingredients and cooking methods. Even an Australian food court operator has enough business sense to market a particular cuisine rather than starting a pan-Asian cuisine. I agree with um, Cecilia there. Um, I think, you know, it's not just what, we're not just one that, that's to completely disregard all of the different nations and cultures that make up Asia. Um, what I do agree with, though, is that we do have shared experiences, but that's not just an Asian thing. That's for people of colour. That's First Nations people, that's for black people in that sense of othering when it comes to food and the way that we're brought up, the you know, upon migration as well. Um, we have shared experiences, but there is no one Asian Australian food identity that we all share. Maybe I should have amended the question to food identities because then maybe <laughs> <laughs> different answers. But, yeah, I, I totally I agree. They're like the tendency to there's a tendency to overgeneralize or paint Asian as a monolith, um, particularly in Australia, um, where although Asians have existed for a very long time in this country, we're still seen as like one group of people for some reason. Um, unfortunately, that's just led to a lot of like misunderstanding. But when I think of like a multi su successful multicultural identity, um, I kind of think of like America and their food scene and you know, how like certain restaurants from certain cultures have really embedded themselves in the mainstream as just like, that is just the, like a mainstream restaurant now. It's not really seen as like an ethnic restaurant or something you'd go for a special meal. And so my question to this is, you know, Asians have been in this country for a long time, but why hasn't the same happened here? Why hasn't, you know, the same kind of tidal wave happened with those type of restaurants being embedded in Australian mainstream food culture? But it has, hasn't it? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just asking you. I mean, we can find um, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Indian, all kinds of restaurants, all kinds of Asian restaurants everywhere. Mm. Yeah. I'd say we're incredibly multicultural here and mm. we've got huge yeah. diversity. Yeah, super. This, this, is, this is why I do what I'm doing because I know, like, it's okay. It's open-minded, you know, open-mindedness. They're willing to accept it. So, yeah. I don't. I wouldn't do. I, do, I wouldn't do what I do in Asia. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I guess. So, on that, Eska, do you think there is some sort of like contemporary modern Australian Asian Australian identities in that sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're a melting pot, you know. Like uh, every cuisine together is is basically yeah Asian Australian food identity, and I hope that. With what I'm doing, merging all types of uh, classic dishes or whatever you want to call it, all in one menu can help expedite sort of this identity, you know, this this idea that everyone that has migrated here is Asian Australian food identity. It's helped, you know, Afghan to, to India to Asia, you know, all parts of Asia, all in one. And I think generally um, white Australians are very open-minded in their um 
food taste. You can mm. see young Australian young men strapping young men, wielding chopsticks, <laughs> eating laksa in a food court. You won't find that in parts of many parts of Europe. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I kind of struggle with with that question because I um. I spent a bit of time in New York, which isn't representative of all of America, for sure. Um, it's much more diverse there, and there is definitely like so many kinds of food and cuisines there. You know, there's definitely not like one specific American identity there. It's a it's a real mixing pot. And I felt I, I definitely felt like being there was actually easier to. It was a place that I got to connect in with my culture and identity because there was a community of female Asian chefs that I met because uh, and all of them were like using food to explore their culture and their identity. And since coming back here, I haven't found that community. Um, obviously, you know, what you guys are doing through Asian Australian, the Asian Australian project is amazing, but I don't know if it's actually really discussed with as much frankness and uh, honesty as it is in, in American food media. And also food media in Australia, I find, as you've mentioned, Rashani is incredibly white. And continues to be. And, you know, the top jobs of new restaurants that are opening continue to be white men who have a name already. I, it's like, yes, Australia is multicultural, but there's also this like this barrier to real conversation and real discussion about what we're doing wrong or what we, where we still need to go. I agree. Um, I agree. I think you got, you just need to look at the foundations of Australia to understand why the countries like that, you know, were built on genocide. Um, and even if you look at the the concept of Asian Australian, and like what is Australian, you know, mm. um, you've got to really con- you've got to question what that identity really means as well. One thing that I like that you know some great Asian Australian chefs are doing are incorporating a lot of native ingredients into their cooking as well um, in consultation with First Nations people. And I think that's really amazing, but Mm -hmm. um, I totally understand what Shinny means. Like it's, it's tough to find the community that are really making waves like that because the community is just so small right now and we're just growing, you know, we're just starting. Um, That's why I created culinary. um, So we do have a safe space because it's just a huge lack of that at the moment. And we're just, that's why this is great because it's empowering us to create more safe spaces for ourselves. And I guess like, I have a question. This is more specific for Cecilia because of your food history background, but have you like in your research, have you really seen, I'm not sure if you've done research about, I guess, Asians in Australia, but have you really seen that kind of evolution of identity? Um, I mean, primarily before it was like just Chinese migrants, but have you seen that evolution in like food identity that has changed since I guess the 1800s or the late, early 20th century? For me, I think what is lacking here in that respect is food studies in higher education. In the United States, so many universities and colleges have food studies courses in history, sociology, anthropology, archaeology, the lot. But in Australia, we um, initially had a culinary school in Adelaide. And now there's one in uh, Melbourne. They're all very small and not doing very well. Perhaps we should invest more money in higher education, in food studies, and encourage not just um, Asian food scholars, but scholars of all cultures to learn more about food and community. I think it's interesting how there's a food scene in Australia, but to get into that there's like a very big barrier then maybe education is that because I think I'm not, I'm not very familiar, but like from what I know, you can either go to the culinary school, you can go to a TAFE. Yeah. That is a big barrier to that food scene. If there is, I guess, a multicultural identity that we have in Australia, do you think, or do you think, I guess, amalgamation of those food identities, or I guess, do you think fusion is the amalgamation of those identities? Like, is that where we're going forward in, in terms of, an identity or identities in the future in Australia? I mean, I think that there will, there's probably like a growing wave of trying to go back to what is, what the traditions or the origins of things. Of course, there's going to continue to be interpretations and reinterpretations, but I feel like there is growing interest in like the roots of things and why things are the way they are or, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm channeling that through through food, you know. I, I, I try not to say too much, even though I look love speaking. Trying to deliver that in food um, is sort of my goal. Uh, yeah, showing you the traditional classic way, but you know, in a um, Australian way, you know. We're always moving forward and open and, and you know, perhaps using lemon myrtle in your curry instead of lime leaves, you know. Perhaps mm. using hazelnuts in your nasi lemak instead of normal peanuts. Expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I believe in I believe in these things and uh yeah, we'll always continually grow. Like yeah, for example, the other day, um an Italian chef told me that uh tomatoes are recently added into Italian cuisine. It's all new. Yeah, Misu is is because of mascarpone and mascarpone was introduced uh in the past, you know, twenty years. It was it was all new. So yeah. maybe everything that we know is all new too, you know? Touching on what Shinyi mentioned before as well, uh regarding migration. When we migrate to new countries, ingredients change or what we have on hand is different. And I think the world is headed towards, you know, a dire place if we don't act upon sustainability now itself. And and that also sustainability means using local ingredients and local in Australia are native bush foods and planting those foods and regenerating the soil and making sure we use those ingredients in our cooking. And if you're not sure, then consult a First Nations place or and always make sure you buy your bush foods from First Nations owned businesses. That's like something I preach. Um, but, you know, there's just so much to learn here that we can integrate into our everyday cuisine and cooking as well, um, just like what Eska said. So maybe that is fusion <laughs> in a different way. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that's adapting. That's- Adapting yeah. it. Agreed. Fusion is a funny word because like that kind of is based on the assumption that like you're fusing two cuisines, which are in and of themselves very distinct and like static. But if those cultures are always, and those cuisines are always moving and changing, then fusion is just like everything really. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I think fusion and the way it's been used is, uh, is a little like obsolete. Spaghetti laksa. <laughs> <Yum>. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so yeah. I guess that's fusion one way. Well, surprisingly, like spaghetti is kind of like noodles. So, you know, yeah. maybe it's not actually just off. a different way of describing it. <laughs> exactly. It's trending. Um, it sells. It sells. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Doesn't mean it's um, good. <laughs> I guess for the panelists and people who don't know, we actually did a poll of these questions on our social media and I thought it would be really interesting to see what people thought because we don't know if people do agree or disagree with um, the panelists. Um, so I'll let Angela, I'll hand it over to Angela because I don't have the results on my screen. That's the results. So the first question, about 61% of us disagree with that. Like say we have a mix, you know, some people are undecided. Definitely. Yeah. Second question, there is no such thing as the original recipe. So actually 63% of people disagreed. So people do find that there is the original and traditional recipe. You see? <laughs> <laughs> I win. <laughs> and I think it's quite interesting seeing all the, everyone's comments in the chats tonight. Like everyone's definition of guess what is traditional could be different. Also, Asian community and individuals are too overprotective of their food culture. So disagree. I'm Go. on the money. <laughs> oh, that's good. Did you make a bet or something? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I got two, two out of three. Okay. <laughs> but no, it's, I think too, it's important because I think one thing. <laughs> well, the money. In order to cook Asian cuisine, you need to be extremely knowledgeable about the culture and food you're cooking. So the most popular answer was agree on that. Oh, someone's popped in, strongly disagree. If we've got a bit, a couple of minutes now, yeah. what do you guys feel like about this question? Do you kind of agree with that comment or? No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I disagree. Please, please be knowledgeable. Uh, I disagree. But, like, are you talking about a home cook? Because I think a home cook can certainly cook Asian cuisine if they want oh, to. Oh, yeah. Oh, they yeah. be extremely knowledgeable about it. Yes, Undecided. that's a good call. <laughs> <laughs> I meant, like, a chef who owns. A chef, yeah. Yeah, well, chef yes, should for sure. Probably know. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then the last question, is there... Uh, Asian food culture identity. Asian food yes. identity. <laughs> Undecided, I know. Three out of five. <laughs> you win, Eska. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that. And I think, too, something about food, it's always going to be subjective. I like this like, kind of phrase, you know, food and taste is kind of in, well, food is kind of, that beauty of food is in, like, the taste of the beholder. So everyone has, like, a different palate. 
Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see how food is always adapted and everyone has their just different versions of how they mix their dishes. Mm -hmm. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to open up our floor for Q&A. So how do you maintain original cultural significance to dishes while making them relatable to members of Australia's diverse community who have yet to try it? Why do you need to make it relatable? That's a, that's a good point though, yeah. I guess because if, you're, if you work in a restaurant, you have to be able to sell it. Yeah, <laughs> you got to sell it. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, kind of... <laughs> but I, I guess, agree with you in principle. I agree with you in principle, um, Rashani, for sure. Mm. Why is it all? Why do we have to change things? Mm. Make them understand. For, for me, I do. I do try to tend to make it relatable for the Australians. Uh, I do use what's around me. So, um, like perhaps the the Hinava of Borneo was using finger lime. You know, like not not every never, every Australian that's living in Australia knows that a finger lime exists. Or perhaps maybe the goat curry that I'm using with lemon myrtle and lemon verbena. It's not really relatable, but it's Australian ingredients. So that's how I sort of connect with them. You know make them sort of understand because, you know, food is, uh, Asian food is seen cheap. Uh, so trying to elevate it with uh, Australian ingredients and make it acceptable for them can increase the price, hopefully, and, you know, have a better representation representation of uh, price for food. That's why I do it. Yeah. Awesome. Another question is, <laughs> I don't know, why is it that Western cuisine seems to be more high-end, whereas Asian food tends to be cheap? I'm just curious to hear everyone, <laughs> everyone has a view on that. Uh, because, because Western food is, is yeah, race, it's racism. Mm-hmm. It's white food. White food is expensive. Uh, Asian food, uh, black food, it's, yeah, it's the cultural thing. It's, it's, it's what society says. Yeah, I agree. I think also you've got to look at, what's taught in culinary school. It's French technique, isn't it? It's not Asian yeah. techniques, is it? Yeah. It's hot cuisine for a reason, right? That's yeah. why, because it's pitched as the fancy food, whereas mm-hmm. Asia is synonymous with cheap going, you know, to Vietnam, sitting on a plastic stool, eating out in the humidity, or yeah. eating a bowl of pho. But that's not necessarily all that that is. I think that's why. And It also ties into, again, the lack of diversity in executive positions across the board and especially in food media, again, you know, just keep pigeonholing it into cheap eats lists and and, Mm -hmm. and pitching it that way. Well, it's just going to be this never ending cycle, isn't it? Yeah. And like, you know, we probably order from the same supplier and I'm I'm cooking Asian food and my neighbor is cooking Western food. But we're using the same supplier, so but he can charge more and and get away with it, but I can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah. But we use the same. We pay the same to staff. We pay the same price for produce. It's yeah. yeah. Wake up, man! Like this is the reality of it. But yes. I think it's also the uh, difference between the average restaurant and fine dining. We also have fine dining. Cantonese restaurants, uh, fine dining Indian restaurants, those are quite expensive as well. So it's, it's like comparing apples and pears or oranges or whatever. Um, yeah. To get back to Indian food, I think um, even in the suburbs, Indian food seems to be marginally or a bit more expensive than Chinese or Vietnamese or Thai food. Is that your experience as well? Mm. Yeah, there, there's, been, there's been restaurants that have... have uh, uh, appropriate pricing you know um it's just yeah the topic yeah is is high end and cheap food you know like asian food has always been seen cheap and um yeah and and what i'm trying to do is make it look more pretty and 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 trending and and hopefully that that's uh that's appreciation for that and that, that they can pay pay for it you know cuz sometimes uh art and story is is the gateway to being able to charge more you know if we just sold a ban me, it will never go for ten dollars. Yeah, I do think it's a self fulfilling prophecy though. If the if we continue to place majority of Asian cuisines in our cheap eats list, then we're gonna keep. It's gonna keep happening. We're gonna keep. They're gonna keep feeling the demand of you know consumers coming in being like, why is your bun me $9 when I can get it for $6 down the road? Because yeah. media keeps, you know, putting him back in that list, which is why when I worked at Time Out as the food and drink editor, I tried to diversify those cheap eats lists because they told me that they had to exist for some reason. Um, and, and you know, take out the majority of Asian cuisine in there because that's not what it should be. And, and also just not working on the best bun me list because it's just ridiculous because it always comes down to price point when we discuss bun me for some reason where it's just a sandwich mm-hmm. to just be appreciated because it's different from venue to venue. Um, don't get me started on that. But, 
Yeah, I just think we the it's also it's up to media, but it's also up to consumers in the way that we view food. And you know, if you think that a venue is dishing up food a lot cheaper than what it should be, then tip. They they need the profit to be able to deliver something that you believe would be more expensive. You know, it's just not enough profit. Yeah, and I'm having to justify why. Um, my food costs ninety five dollars. Like I'm trying to tell people, like I'm using the best produce from the best farms, organic, and I'm I'm supplying the the produce, the producers, and 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 it's still not enough. It's still oh too expensive. Mm. It's like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Yeah, there's like, a general using, yeah, yeah the best produce in Australia, and it's still not okay for you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a general misconception about how much food actually costs or should cost at a restaurant um, by the general public, mm. I think. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Huge disconnect. I, yeah, and I, I hate that, um, Eska, you have to do all these things to yeah. justify making it more expensive when it should actually just be what it is. And no yeah. one should, you shouldn't have to be questioned about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also think like the pricing of food generally has reflected just the socioeconomic status of different cultures in the mm. through history, and so this 100%. is just where we're at right now. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. We're not even we're not even making a single profit. Like our menu is like we're meant to be thirty percent, but we're up like fifty, sixty percent just to sort of sell you this menu and educate you and get you to like really appreciate Asian food. Mm-hmm. And it's so, so just so hard to to even make you appreciate what we're trying to do and 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 understand that you know produce is expensive and 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 labor costs and all we're trying to do is just share you our love for Asian food. Yeah. And nah, mm-hmm. too expensive. I'll go get a ban me. So, yeah, it's it, it's interesting. Oh. I, I I struggle with this a bit at Cafe Fritas because. Everybody loves pasta in Sydney. Like everybody is obsessed with Italian food. Um, and so you put, you put pasta on the menu and it sells just like that, like immediately. No question about how much it is, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I was debating whether or not, and I use the same noodles for this other beef dish that I've got. And I was like, I wonder if this is going to be as um, sought after if I call it fresh noodles versus like fresh spaghetti. Mm. Um, so it's like been an interesting kind of experiment for me to see what our clientele likes and how they respond to things like that. Um, and yeah, just, just the whole debate of like, why is, you know, and it's been talked about in many articles uh, about why, you know, a bowl of pasta can be so much more expensive than a bowl of noodles. And mm. Just because yeah. of the way it's described. It's so true. And then you don't see people going like, oh, my God, they charge $18 for a bowl of pasta and $22 for a bowl of pasta there. It's like they never talk about that. Yeah. But they yeah. do when it comes to our foods and it just blows my mind. Yeah, same. <laughs> same. I don't understand. So, so I'm curious, is there anything you would, you know, from your, I guess, your food historian perspective that you can under- see? Or like, so oh. in terms of like why would perhaps there be like an idea that Western cuisine is more high end? Um, like I said before, it um, it depends on the restaurant. The like Mr. Wong in Sydney, it's high end. I don't know whether it's still there. And basically, it's the, the same dumplings, but you pay like three or four times the price of it. And I would argue, why would I go there? Because they have nice tablecloths. Um, the taste is the same. So for me, it's not about different. Asian cuisines, but the types of um, of restaurants. There's some research done on how tablecloths, white linen, uh, sparkling glasses, they all um, are in high end. And then you have the Chinese restaurants with the red lanterns and the double luck or uh, double happiness uh, signages. So th- there's that dichotomy of, of difference of what people expect. And quite often, it's not so much the food as your expectation of what the food is going to be like. That's also very true. And also what ties into that is service and the notion of service and how that is a very Western construct. Yeah. You know. I just wish that uh, every dish that's out there with Asian food, you can peel back and like reveal the truth of the cost mm-hmm. <laughs> and why you're pricing it that way. Oh, you like, should do that. You should so do that. Would you like to know the real cost of this? <laughs> <laughs> peel it back. Okay. Yeah. Do it. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I, some Asian, because like Cecilia, we were talking about there also is the existence of like fine dining Asian food as well. But like, I think there also is like a kind of like an attitude that like oh, some Asians might be like, I won't go there because I can cook that at home. Like it's too expensive. Why would I pay, you know, like $50 for this when I can just make it at home myself? So do you think this attitude also contributes to the kind of cheap food, like Asian is cheap food as well. Mm. But for myself, like when I go out to eat, it's a treat and I would order foods that I'm not capable of cooking. I think that relates to, to a lot of us. Um, I'm not talking about a takeaways or a, a, a lunch meal or something, but like if it's a, um, going out for dinner, not necessarily a special occasion, but to go out for dinner, then I would choose something that I can't cook at home. Definitely. That's like, I'm definitely guilty of, having that attitude sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I feel that way about um, pasta. (laughs) When I go to a restaurant, I'm like, why would I go and spend that much on pasta when I can just make that at home? Mm -hmm. I I think I might have, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. Do you think Asian food is easier or harder to cook compared to, say, West European or African cuisine? So that probably relates. There's a different skill set, as we probably all said. Yeah, I think that would be a gross generalisation. Um, cause again, you're just grouping all Asian cuisines into one and this is way too much regionality and techniques and everything to even explore that question. Mm. It's also, what did you grow up learning to cook? Something that's foreign exactly. to you is going to be harder to cook than something that you saw your mom cooking every day or something like that. So, totally. Yeah. I think they're just categorizing in food as stir fry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Which, of course, then it is pretty easy to yeah. cook. Yeah, <laughs> good chicken rice, a good biryani, yeah. a good soup is hard, man. There's so much technique going into it. Mm-hmm. But if it's second nature to you, it's not. <laughs> mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love me a biryani. <laughs> 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 it depends, it depends, it depends, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How do we as Asian Australians justify the points of using correct dishes, basically? When we're oh, my things? gosh, yeah. Just say it right. God, how hard is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can't, yeah, just correct people. I always correct people. Yeah. Like, I think it's, a, yeah, sorry, go with No, me. I was just about to get angry at people <laughs> misspelling bun me. When people spell like bun, like autobahn or something, like B-A-H-N me, and I'm like, <laughs> next time someone does that. <laughs> I, I think no, it's, so, yeah. yeah, I think it's like, I just reading this question, it's like the same as, you know, someone, me being like, oh, don't worry about pronouncing my name right. It can, you know, just say Zen or something. That's fine. Which is the way that I introduced myself a lot growing up because I was like, I'm just going to make it easy for them and for myself. Um, it's kind of in the same topic, really. Like, it's really important to, yeah, hold true to the the correct name of a dish, of a person, of like anything. I think that's really 100%. important. Yeah, hundred percent. So important for cultural preservation as well. Yeah. Cool. Oh, sorry. I had a question for Cecilia because I think you wrote an article, I think in the conversation about really the interactions between Chinese like migrants um, working in the gold fields and their food with like the white population. But for example, like dim sim, like we, I think it's a very Australian dish, but we know the word actually comes from dim sum, I think. So yeah. do you think like the language will inevitably have to change to suit I guess the more broader Asian or more broader like Australian population in that sense. Changing the names of dishes, you say? I think not like changing, but I guess the evolution of the name because like dim sim, dim sum, and it's kind of, you know, in embedded in Australian language now. Yeah. I don't know, but like the um, the dim sum that you see on highway station, uh, petrol stations, like those big, uh, things I call them an aberration of um of dim sum. Um, but if it has become part of the Australian culture, why not? Um, everything evolves. Everything is changing. We live in a globalized world. It may still be popular in ten years' time. It may not be. It may die out. It doesn't matter. And 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 people do know that the origin is is Chinese. And I I don't think we can have so many hard and fast rules of the exact origin, the exact provenance of each dish and ingredient. Um, it's evolving. Everything is evolving, including ingredients, um, cooking methods, everything. Mm. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do agree. I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's important to preserve the, the original story of the history, isn't it? Like with the dim sim, it's important that future generations remember what that's about. And also like if we can remember what a Negroni is named after and that was how long ago, <laughs> hundreds of years ago or whatever, then surely we can remember the dim sim and it's dim sum yeah. story. And also like in, in Malaysia and Hong Kong, we say we go for dim sum and we know that it's, it's a dim sum meal, a brunch or lunch or whatever. But in Australia, we say yam cha and yam cha literally means drink tea. So it's different uh, language usage in different locations. It doesn't really matter. Mm, 100%. Um, that's why it's also, again, important to have, if you are like a white person with an Asian restaurant or something, to have a cultural like correspondent or someone that you actually um, talk to about the theme. So for example, I remember seeing a few times while working at Time Out, there was a venue that did a, a bottomless like yum cha brunch or something. And it was like Aperol spritzes instead of tea. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense because <laughs> it literally means to drink tea. Um, but that kind of just like, uh, obviously it's a white owned thing as well, but just, yeah, that disconnect, that cultural disconnect as well. It's shocking. <laughs> I think a popular, I saw a lot of people complaining in the comments about like chai tea or like naan bread. Oh, and so it's very- bad. But it's not just food. It's like ATM machine and nashi pear and countless others. I think it, is it more of a faux pas or is it more just like a maybe coming out of ignorance? I think it's, yeah, more ignorance than anything. How can we use food as a way to highlight inequality in the ethnic community? Counter to that question, have you think have you thought that like basically having a lot of, I guess, Asian food present in Australia has helped, you know, intercultural understanding? No one's going for it. Yeah. <laughs> Tough question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a one, yeah. I think maybe like an example, um, because I'm in Melbourne, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre actually has a catering branch. Mm. And um, if you support their catering business, you actually support um, the asylum seekers and refugees that actually run the catering business. And then the food that they cook is actually from like their culture and things like that. So I think that's a really great way to highlight the inequalities in ethnic communities and specifically like, you know, supporting um, asylum seekers in Australia as well. But like, maybe that's just an example. I don't know. Anyone has an example? Yes, um, Parliament um, in King Street in, in Sydney, in Newtown, they're doing exactly the same thing. Um, Ravid, the proprietor, he um, employs asylum seekers or refugees to do the cooking and he trains them and then they go out and work in the community and he started another one, another restaurant in um, Darling Harbour called Uma. Um, during the pandemic, when he couldn't open the restaurants, he was supplying soups, either free or at very cheap cost to people who could not afford it. So there's a uh, um, great work going on there. Mm-hmm. I also think food, you know, we all understand food as being a very universal thing that everybody can engage with. And so someone might not know anything about a certain culture or an ethnic group, but if you eat the food, you, you can connect to them in a way, um, in a more personal way than, than just reading about, um, you know, something in the news or, or something like that. So food generally, cooking the food or trying the food of a, of a marginalised ethnic community is, I think, one way to just kind of for there to be more connection and empathy between different cultures. Yeah, I have friends in America now who are order food or eat in Ukrainian restaurants as a, a sign of solidarity. Mm. I think that's nice. And you can see like there's a lot of those social movements too. Like I remember um, I think there was a hashtag in the peak of, I was just say COVID when there was all the lockdowns, a lot of people were actually avoiding a lot of Chinese restaurants or like Asian restaurants. So I know there was that whole movement too, like eating at restaurants in Chinatown or in areas that were affected mm. by that. And also now, no, there's now when we can go out more in public too, there's more like, you know, people going out to eat out and support their local businesses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, cool. Now, it's always great to hear like too, this how like food, I've heard the phrase, you know, food is a great equalizer and kind of food can kind of help. It's a universal language that can kind of bridge, you know, different cultures together. Yeah, but I also, I mean, that's like a really lovely romantic way of, and a very true way of viewing food, but food is, food is also um, a great uh, reinforcer of like socioeconomic difference yeah. and inequality. So I don't think we should 
continue to just talk about that side of food as being an equalizer, bringing people together, which it does, all those things. And I love that about food. But there's, you know, darker aspects to it through history. Definitely. That's true. Yeah, 100%. Even if you look at another way to highlight the inequalities in ethnic communities, again, like migrants that might move here, forced into low economic kind of factory roles, um, and they are the ones that are making the you know canned foods, anything. Um, mm. That's another, I guess, inequality in ethnic communities with food. Just one more, I think, to end the night. Do you guys all have a favourite food memory that you guys all have? <laughs> <laughs> so many, man. <laughs> yeah, so many. Right. Or maybe the most recent one, if it's yeah, the, most, <laughs> the most recent best. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, last night me and Rush uh, went to Ben Yu <laughs> Kitchen. Um, and, yeah, they uh, they were like, uh, they posted out uh, a story, an uh, 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 Instagram post saying that, you know, it's, it's time for us to put up the prices. And, you know, in my mind, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's fair. Oh, good. Um, and I was like really uh, nervous. But, uh, yeah, everything they do was... Uh, was uh, adequate and appropriate and yeah so delicious and it's like really hard to do simple things really well um and everything that they do there is like top notch you know sugar Mm. pea snaps was done beautifully noodles had the good wok hay um the 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 chicken poussin poussin yeah poussin yeah it was so (laughs) good yeah just so tender Um. and like even me i didn't even know there was a chinese rose wine I, 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 yeah, like, Chinese rose wine. It's really yeah, good. We we all thought it was just Shaoxing wine, but it was um like a certain specific Chinese rose wine that was used to cook the um, the chicken. And now it's inspired yeah. me to use Australian uh, skin contact wine or red wine to cook my poultry. That's cool. It's cool. It's, I love that. Yeah, I, it's, it inspires it's, you. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really lovely dinner. And like referring to um, the post that Eska had saw that Benio Kitchen um, was formed by some um, staff that left Lau's Family Kitchen, which is an institution here formed by Gilbert Lau, who is um, known for Flower Drum. Um, and they made an Instagram post about having to pitch up the prices because to reflect the price of produce going up and because mm. of supply shortages. And just it's it's kind of sad that they felt the need that to do that, you know, but it is often expectation. It comes back to, you know, how Asian food is viewed, right? Yeah. Um, that if you raise your prices, then you're going to need to justify it, especially when it comes to fun me. But um, we went, we supported them. We love the food. Um, prices yeah. are great. And yeah, it was just, it was awesome. That was a very nice food memory. That's great to hear. <laughs> so good. So good. Really, really good. Like, as an Asian, I, I, I really uh, appreciate it. And uh, I've learned a lot. And yeah. Yeah, everyone should be uh, just yeah increasing their prices and, and charging the right price, you know. Yeah. Um, and everyone should do it. And the more we do it, the the more this topic about oh Asian food cheap it will be removed, you know. Um. Well, it was Lunar New Year recently, so um, you know, had some amazing meals with my family, um, but also at Frida's, I did a bit of a. Uh, Lunar New Year special menu for a couple of weeks. Um, that was really fun. And I guess being able to serve um, yi sang, which is the big salad that you have with all the different components and is usually just done at, in, at home because it's just so much preparation. Being able to serve that at, uh, at the restaurant was quite special to me. So Sounds amazing. Um, so the last fantastic meal I had was at Wildflower in Perth. I guess you would loosely say it's modern Australian. Um, they use a lot of um, indigenous ingredients, very well crafted, fantastic service, beautiful, beautiful food. If you um, ever in Perth, do go to Wildflower. Definitely. That sounds so nice. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sounds like we have to, if we're ever in Perth, when we get there, now yeah. that the borders are going to open in two days, <laughs> yeah. we should definitely check out Wildflower. A very good Asian one, high uh, fine dining is Long Chim as well, also in the same vicinity. Making me hungry again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Food itself is such a broad topic and there are so many things that we can discuss. And like, like I think what Cecilia said, and I think, Someone in the comments um, said that it ties in with the economic structure, the way we live and everything like that. And that's something that cannot be touched in or discussed in two hours. So um, on, I guess, behalf of like AAP, we would love to thank the panelists for taking their time out um, to, you know, talk to us and really like understand and unpack this topic and really reflect critically on food and not just asking 
those, you know, I guess neat uh, cliche questions of like, oh, is fusion food racism or like why this and that? And I think like this conversation has really opened up um, like that kind of barrier of actually having to talk about food, frankly, which is, you know, something you kind of touched on, Shingy, like having those honest discussions about food and how it's actually impacting people and, you know, how we can actually transform the way we, you know, approach food, eat food, look at food, how we run food businesses as well. These are the um, panelists' social media, like if you would love to follow them on social media, see what they're up to. Um, I'll like Rushani and Cecilia are both um, working currently on different projects. Cecilia is working um, on a, currently on an upcoming book on global history of Hakka food. Um, and uh, Rushani is um, working very hard on issue three of uh, culinary. I think it's about fire. The theme is fire. And you're looking, yeah, for, looking for, for pictures me. if anyone yeah. is interested in pitching. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> feel free to keep in touch with the panelists and we will put this up on our slides. Uh, we'll send it out to all the attendees as well in case you want to keep in touch. Um, lastly, uh, we'd love to thank you for coming tonight to our fourth iteration of our fireside chat. Um, <laughs> We'd love, we thank you. <laughs> what a <fire. laughs> um, Yeah, so we'd love, we'd love to um, hopefully see you at our next events and our next fireside chats. And then the topic is interesting. So you guys hopefully will get excited for that. Um, and we, again, have our panelist information if you would like to contact them. But we wouldn't be here without our audience, which is you. And by being here, you are supporting the Asian Australian community and businesses that, um, that we highlight and spotlight in our radar. So these are the social media and uh, listed below are our um, links for any support if anything has caused you distress during this um, event. So there's Beyond Blue Headspace and then the Butterfly Foundation for Eating Disorders if that anything has come up for them. But again, we'd like to thank you for coming and thank you for stopping by. And yeah, have a great night. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank Amazing. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun. That was fun.